Hello everyone, welcome back to The Beginning Corporation. Uh, don't worry for those of you who watch every day. Uh, this is episode 14. I'm doing a favor to a friend who is uh, phobic about the number 13. You did not miss an episode. <laughs> so, uh, just to recap, uh, we are making an incremental game using Business Central functionality where players use bots to generate transactions and revenue and compete to see who can make the most revenue during a period of time, which we will call a season. So, uh, Yesterday, we spent some time with the Excel buffer working on creating an import tool uh, to try to bring in Excel data through the Excel buffer uh, from a format that maybe a user might love, but the uh, config package system absolutely would hate. So, uh, in order to uh, continue with that today, we will see if we can. Uh, we, we aren't too far off from uh, having that working. Um, I did resolve the issue. Uh, as, as I mentioned yesterday, uh, a lot of times when you're running into a code bug, the thing to do is to put it up down and come back to it. Uh, and as soon as I did so, of course, I spotted the issue right away. But our primary focus today Day is going to be about translations. Um, there was a wonderful uh, tip that was brought up on Twitter about using a third-party open source tool to edit translation files and a very clever way to leverage the fact that Microsoft makes available the translation files for the base app. Uh, if we can get through that process, then we will uh, also enable CodeCop and see what sort of mischief that that is going to present to us. And depending on where we are there, then we will go ahead and finish up uh, the master import item tool. So, um, okay, well, uh, so uh, translations. Let's talk about what that is uh, from a perspective of uh, how captions are handled in the Business Central system. Uh, if you did not know already, we've been uh, tagging things with captions all along the way. Um, these captions are used to build a translation file uh, automatically, but that translation file is something we have to tell the system that we would like to have generated. And we have not done so. It is not enabled by default. So we need to come to our app JSON. And at the root level of the configuration of this, we are going to enable a feature. And if we take a look here, uh, one of the things that we can enable as a feature is the translation file which is going to generate translation files in XLIF format. Uh, yay. <laughs> so now when we save this translation, uh, this app JSON, the next time we package, uh, which we can just package, uh, if we published or any of the other steps, you'll see that it creates an entirely new folder in the root called translations. The uh, name of this file is based on the name of the extension .g for, I presume, global uh, .xlf. Uh, so as you can see here, uh, based on the translation that we've, uh, the code we've done so far, this has a lot of data in this file. It is effectively an XML file, so you can use any XML view or editor or just text editor to go ahead, uh, to edit this file. Uh, no problem. Uh, it gives a lot of data, um, <laughs> some of it useful, some of it uh, probably more useful to tools than I currently know about. But the main thing here is that uh, because I am working in ENUS, it, this is in source language ENUS. And this file is simply saying that we are going to target the language ENUS. Uh, that uh, is the basis that we use to then create alternate languages. Um, as you can see here, it creates a entry called a transunit. Um, this is a 
international standard for uh, XML for translation files. So you can use these with translation sources and lots of third party tools uh, work with these type of files. Um, it assigns a unique table number and field number and then property number to each node that is used uh, to connect uh, how which caption goes with what to place. Um, I'm not 100% sure why uh, they didn't simply use the table number and the field number and then generate a property number. Um, but in discussions in GitHub, the uh, IDs that are generated here are a funky hash of the ID and name. Um, it's not a secure hash or anything like that. It can be reverse engineered. Uh, but that does mean that if you rename tables and fields, this whole section will change. Um, that can potentially be, be a big deal. Then within each trans unit, uh, it creates the source entry, which is what the text should be in the default source language. And then what we will see is we're going to create a target uh, node to match the target language. Obviously, that would be quite a bit of work uh, to do this manually. Uh, we are not nuts. We're not going to do that. Um, <laughs> so uh, it does go. Uh, also give us a little extra information in e the notes here. Uh, so for example, we can see that this came from this table, the BCS bot instance, the field instance ID, and the property caption. So we know that this is the caption for instance ID on the bot instance table. Now, in the extension pack that we've talked about uh, that I'm using, uh, there is a extension here uh, in this pack called xlif sync, uh, which provides us with some pretty handy commands for our solution. So if we look at some of the things that are added to the command palette, uh, for the xlif files, we can create new target translations. So we are going to create a new target file. Oh, good. <laughs> uh, that resulted in error. Delightful. OK, well, uh, we're going to do this manually. Exciting. You go to try something new. Try to. Uh, so, uh, okay, in our translation file here, uh, what we are going to do is we are going to copy and paste, and instead of .g.copy, we are going to do .sv.se. We're going to make a Swedish translation today. Enjoy some of the vocabulary you may acquire from this stream. Uh, so uh, in the naming of things, we are using this ISO code for Sveria, uh, Svenska, Sweden. Um, and we match with the target language here. OK, well, that's a good start. But now how are we going to you know, try to work with all of these sources? Uh, I was led to a program uh, out there that is uh, open source. Uh, there is a pro version, but uh, I wanted to talk about this today. Um, it is something called uh, PoEdit or PoEdit. I'm not 100% sure, but uh, anyways, it is a free download and you are able to use the free version for licensed use for commercial use. Um, and it is kind of interesting. Um, what Pro gets you is additional support and using uh, machine translation sources, uh, but we can skip over that for the moment. Uh, I have downloaded that, so let me grab my downloads here. And we will install that because I wanted to have a nice fresh version of it because it was a little bit confusing to get it set up. So the actual installation process, very next, next, next. Uh, this runs over the agreement. I read it earlier. Yes, I'm, I'm a nut. I, I read these license agreements. <laughs> Occasionally, there's very funny things in there. 
but otherwise we don't have any options to worry about here. So now when we first open this up, it's a little bit strange. Uh, it's recommending we open a PO file, a PO file. Um, I'm presuming that's some sort of project package solution, whatever have you. I am instead going to just come on up to open. And uh, we can go to our translation file and grab our target translation, sv.sc say open and now we got a nice little editor um, it's not bad I mean as things go uh, when you first install it you get uh, a small number of automatic online suggestions uh, from uh, Microsoft uh, the machine translation engine there um, I'm not entirely sure I understood the logic behind this. Uh, the pricing on the Pro was a little bit funky um, in that you could pay a monthly subscription and you get Google Translate or DeepL. Uh, if you do a lifetime purchase, you get Bing Translate. I'm not sure what the logic there is, um, and they don't really do a good breakdown of the explanation of what's the uh, advantage of Pro versus four teams. A little baffling. So, uh, but anyways, uh, I am going to shut off the pro functionality. I don't necessarily need uh, <laughs> the, the attempts from Bing uh, to help us out here. I don't think that's going to provide me value, and I will very quickly run out of suggestions. So, uh, to do so, we are going to go to Preferences, which we'll come to a couple of times and we are going to not use suggestions from online. Say OK, and now the suggestions go away. So, uh, OK, so now we've got all of our source text, which we can view and sort by different sorts. So like, for example, we can sort it by sort uh, source code. And we can see now we've got lots of uh, repeating things. So we could very quickly copy and paste the translations from top to bottom. And you'll notice we also have uh, insight here into the notes for translators showing uh, exactly which tables they come from. So we can quickly go to the source and have some idea of what's the context. Like, is this an address for a bot? Is it an address? Ah, it's a random entity name pool address. Okay. Okay, so you get some context. No, well, it's not too bad. It's not amazing. All right, what else can we get out of this? Because um, we can edit these files in lots of different ways. Where the sh magic happened for me was that you can install existing translations into the memory of this program. Um, so if we look at uh, one of the DVDs, for example. I've got my uh, 16 CU3 uh, on-prem DVD. And here in the applications, in the base app, if we look at source, we got a whole bunch of language uh, packs in here. So if I go ahead and open that up and look in translations, here's our 65 meg base app translation. We can pull that out, which I have done into a folder, and we can import that translation file into the translation memory so that we can leverage all of Microsoft's existing translation work in our solution. So now it will do its best effort to guess for us based on the uh, other translations that are in the rest of the base app, what does it think we should use as a translation? So as you can see, now when I click on address, it gives us suggestions over here. And uh, this is correct. That is the Swedish translation. So I can just control one and select that. Uh, here, for example, the back action, I could choose uh, back. I guess that that is a translation, but in fact I want the second one. So you can very quickly leverage uh, some of the existing uh, handling of things. Uh, so for example, uh, base price, we could go, okay, well, 
price is right, base is better, but it should really be both combined, and you can simply just type, you know, base, base price. Now, that's not too bad. Um, I kind of dig that, but that would be a lot to still go through where we're trying to come through here. Uh, and, you know, every time there's a code field, I have to specifically come into this click, control one, click, blah, blah, blah. Uh, this is 100% for sure match, check. And it is correct, it is 100% for sure match. So we can hit pre-translate. And on our first pass, we can say only fill in exact matches. Burp. And now we have a significant number of those fields automatically filled in from uh, the existing handling uh, of the language that is the Microsoft Business Central translation for those field names. Whether it's 100% accurate to the local usage, that's always a fun, <laughs> as I've learned, that's a fun way of learning a language, but it's not always how everyone locally would choose to phrase things. Uh, but we can still take advantage of that. Now, we can also uh, not check in, only fill in exact mess, uh, clear this checkbox. Um, and we can say pre translate again. And now it will say 119 were pre-translating. Those ones were approximate matches. And it will flag the ones that are not perfect matches as needs work. So now you can go, well, uh, copy to, yeah, this was a close match. It actually was right. We don't need work on that. So that's correct. Uh, customer posting groups, this is pretty close. Um, so. We do have some advantages here. Uh, this was pretty close, but it wasn't quite right. However, this was closer. So as uh, we get through this, we will uh, teach this engine what is correct, what isn't correct. And apparently, this develops and grows over time. Um, like, for example, that is way off. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, uh, okay. <laughs> um, so it's not a perfect match system by any stretch, but boy, is that pretty nice. Um, so um, I did notice there were some things here and there that were fantastic and wonderful. I'm going to save this just as is. Um, because I would like to see this in action with how much uh, we've got. Even though I know a variety, the a variety of these are a little crazy. Like designation, that I, that's <laughs> this is help text from some page somewhere. So <laughs> sure. Um, so now if we come in here uh, into our sv.se here, you can see that uh, the source on this instance ID uh, has now got a target uh, node, and it's been given a target uh, translation of server instance ID, but it's also been given a state of needs work. Um, so that's good. Uh, so we still can see here, even looking at the translation file, uh, this isn't quite right yet. Um, I don't know that BC will care about that information. I think it'll still bring in the translation uh, that's flagged as needs work. Uh, it's mostly a reference for editors, uh, like so. Um, so yeah, uh, let's come on into our system. So now, in theory, we should be able, temporarily at least, to be able to hop over to Swedish and see some data or see some captions, I should say. It does not translate data. And that is correct. That is insights. That part is a system part, so it's automatic, etc. And oversight, eh, that's OK. Uh, display name, this, uh, for example, was one that was not translated automatically. But we can see here, uh, head t uh, that one was probably flagged as needs work because master company does not translate to head table number. But uh, a lot of these other things are correctly translated, or at least are translated. So now if we go to our bot list, 
which let's see I'm not entirely sure what had translated our bot list to huh. yeah just translated as ampersand list so that was <laughs> not very helpful and uh, as mentioned that crazy translation that made me chuckle of designation to this huge amount of help text that is exactly where it landed so <laughs> this is enter which table is priority and mark with a cross if we want to prioritize the table in the configuration plan blah 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 blah, blah. obviously that's nonsense but we can see that the translation file is working so this can be a really speedy way to zoom along on translation uh, work, and I'm, I'm a big fan. I like that. Um, I had been working around with a editor in Visual Studio Code that would work similarly, uh, but honestly, if there's an open source community that already does most of what I would want to do, then I'm not going to uh, continue that writing effort. That's fine. Okay, um, so I will not bore the heck out of everyone with a Swedish lesson of finishing off the translations. That would be a terrible use of stream time, and <laughs> it would be crazy. Um, so let's uh, try some things out. For example, uh, I'm not 100% sure how... Let's let's fix this up because a, a couple of good questions about how this works, and I admit I don't know yet. So let's find out. Uh, I uh, code. Sure, that'll work. So now if I manually set this in and then pre-translate, what happens? Hey, that's pretty cool. Okay, so if I fix uh, a single uh, translation that is incorrect, like bot type uh, is currently translating incorrectly, I would still call that bot type. Uh, if I save this and pre-translate again, burp, it did correctly acknowledge that bot type should be become those bot types. Oh, okay. I hadn't actually tried that, so <laughs> yay. Uh, that is fantastic. All right. I'm 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 really enjoying that. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. Well, uh, I think that's as much useful info. Uh, I would encourage people to play around with that. It is not uh, difficult to find this. It is just Googling PoEdit, uh, but poedit.net uh, on that. Uh, so that is open source and seems to be pretty popular and supported. So <laughs> enjoy playing with it. I, if anyone else comes up with some brilliant tips and tricks about how to use that, I would love to see it. Uh, and for those of you who are watching this just for the translation stuff, uh, feel free to jump off now. Now we're going to play around with CodeCop and things. So <laughs> no, no harm if you uh, don't want to continue for the rest of things. All right. Uh, so uh, in our uh, discussion of this project so far, I had mentioned that there are what Microsoft refer refers to as code analysis tools. Um, and they have what are called rule sets that will analyze your code within Visual Studio Code to see if they comply with their rule sets. Um, there are four currently available rule sets from Microsoft. Uh, App Source Cop, uh, which validates all the rules that are required to pass through the App Source ecosystem. The Code Cop rules, which are generally accepted coding standard checks. Uh, there are per tenant extension cop rules, which are rules specifically designed to check over your code to make sure uh, it is multi tenant friendly. And there's also UI cop analyzer rules, which I admit I'm a little less familiar with, but I say we're going to turn on all of them except for the per tenant ex 
extension comp and see what happens. I don't have any idea. Uh, I suspect what's going to happen is I'm going to have a significant number of new problems that have previously not been identified. Um, for anyone who was watching this in order or following along live, uh, the issue yesterday on the uh, import routine was a simple case. Uh, if we uh, if you did not know, uh, when you look at the source control tab and you click on a file of things you've changed, you can compare the two. Uh, so you can see here, this was my issue. Uh, very simply, we had a case of if then, and down here, I wanted this else to be going with this if, and unfortunately, that's not how I wrote it. <laughs> Uh, so for visual clarity to not mess myself up, I wrapped this nicely in a begin end, um, and that makes it a little bit clearer. So what was happening is the import was working correctly, and then we were deleting things. So, yay! <laughs> Always fun to miss simple begin ends. Uh, let's also not mess with anyone watching outside of Sweden and put our UI back into English. Yes, yes. All right. So now, if we go to our master items, you'll see I tested this out earlier, and yep, sure enough, desk kit. Here are the two master uh, com items being used as components, and we can get all of our things in here. So, for example, the, our example case yesterday, where we put 20 uh, fabric on our fan kit. Uh, because apparently it also has a hammock that came in correctly. Uh, all is working well there. So hopefully we can get to the next round of things. I am not going to try on camera to fix every code cop validation because boy howdy, I expect we will have a lot of them. Uh, so let's go to uh, yeah. Uh, Now I'm losing my mind. I wanted workspace settings. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so, uh, me, I would rather see this in JSON. Uh, I'm a big fan of workspace settings, JSON. There we are. Okay. So we have. Our now, when we open up in the command palette the preferences, open workspace settings JSON, you'll see it's creating uh, a, a settings file here in the VS Code folder. And because this is my first workspace specific setting, uh, I am uh, looking at a blank JSON object. And uh, very simply enough, we are going to do uh, enable code analysis and we are changing that from the default to true exciting um and let's see uh we also then need to decide what our code analyzers are and intellisense is our friend here you can see here are our options. So we're going to do these one at a time f at first so we can see how much blows up. <laughs> I, I truly have no idea. Uh, I typically use these from the beginning of a project and fix any issues that pop up along the way. So it'll be interesting to see how bad this is about to get. OK, so let's start with the very basic code cop. We went from one problem to 174. <laughs> oh, oh my. Okay. Um, yeah, there there are a wide array of ones that we did not uh, <laughs> did not do, and boy, is that a lot of a lot of issues. Okie doke. Uh, so we'll probably turn these back off, and I will fix many of these on stream, uh, off stream rather, because some of them are perfectly 
reasonable complaints as mentioned in previous episodes here uh, where i used to have a giant chunk of code i now do a single line function call and if you're doing a single line function call you do not need uh, to wrap that with a begin end uh, statement uh, so there's a whole list of those here in the dispatcher that we can tidy up uh, and you can also see that when we open up objects with code cop turned on we will get all of our warnings um, and we can mouse right over them to see what exactly the issue is. Um, these uh, little indicators here, AL, AA005, uh, this is something that you can look up in the CodeCop rule set to see which rule it's validating and why. Uh, I think we looked at the list on screen a little bit uh, not too long ago, so AA005, it's breaking down this is a warning for readability's sake um, and then sometimes there's a little more detail uh, in this particular case that doesn't really need to be a lot more detail so that's fine uh, we also have a whole lot of things that they're perfectly reasonably correct I think to enforce like for uh, on a page we have bot type Okay, well, on pages, they really would prefer to see that we, there it goes, uh, that we um, give tooltip properties to let the users know what is this about. They very much want us to put a lot more effort into the uh, documenting the system as we go so that it is user-friendly and more usable out of the box. Um, I, I think that's pretty reasonable, to be honest. A um, little extra work, but there we are. Um, and let's look at some of the other odds and ends that are sort of interesting to me. Uh, here in the generate designator, um, we have an example of something I mentioned in our import stream. I'm returning text 10 and I'm passing to this exit function call a to text, which this is an overflow warning. It is possible that this text string builder um, could, if we came back here later and wrote some crazy code, it is entirely possible that could be too long and the only way to fix that is to do that copy string to max string length uh, that we re reviewed earlier uh, so uh, and then there are, this one i like how i clicked it and then because i loaded it it's now thinking hard about things okay It's complaining about line 35 here. Okay, um, this one I've seen some controversy around and some bug fixes in GitHub around these. There are some interesting warnings that they're trying to add uh, to watch for is the person actually modifying the record in any fashion before they do a save execute um, or are they modifying it and forgetting to do some sort of save command obviously um, in our case here with the master item and master bill of material uh, we are doing some validate calls and then calling modify um, my thinking is is that because no, I mean, it seems like it's just a straight up bug. Um, so in this case, I get where they're coming from. They're trying to help us out and prevent us from uh, doing the change of data and then calling pointless modifies and vice versa. Um, it will be a good rule. Uh, it's, it's an in-progress rule. And thankfully, I mean, I think all of these are warnings. Um, so we can compile all of this still. It will work regardless of the fact that we've got all of these warnings. Um, and as you can see, almost all of these are no big deal things. Uh, I'm just scrolling through and almost all of them are tooltip. Should be modified. Tooltip. And then we have a few things here and there where things are unused. And I appreciate for visual clarity that there's a rule about things being unused as a warning. So, so uh, for the most part, I've just got some legwork to do to... Uh, to, to, to. Well, that's interesting. One. Um... Okay. 
So I'm just looking at this little warning, which is a little bit more baffling. Ah, I see. Uh, they're catching for... Um, I am looking at the setup overview page here. I have named uh, these field controls all the following things, like GL account, for example. And then down below here, because I broke one of my rules if I put some code on the page, uh, here I have named uh, these record variables uh, very similar or, I, or in this case identical things to some of the controls on the page, which means that when I call this GL account dot something, it knows from context here that I'm talking about the GL account record, but if I were to remove this variable from this list, this code wouldn't necessarily blow up correctly or could be confusing in that it would then be thinking I'm talking about the control on the page. So it is legitimately complaining that I've named uh, local variables the same as fields. So. So some reasonable uh, warnings, uh, usually around clarity, and some things here and there that are perfectly legitimate complaints. Um, for example, player.name is 100. The text uh, full name is 80, so we could get ourselves into a situation where we text overflow. I like that they warn for these. I think that's a good thing. So uh, I'm going to go and shut off the code cop rules because I want to see what the differences between some of the different rules are. So now if we turn on the UI cop and shut off code cop, let's see how much it blows up. And we're not too bad. Um, we have six warnings now and most of them are things like uh, this card. Uh, is not going to be a searchable card um, because I have not given it a usage category and application area. If I'm using a card that I only want accessible from a list, this can be an ignored warning. Um, the way I would want to do that, however, um, rather than just ignore it <laughs> forever because that's not a great method, um, is set usage category none. There we are. That lets the compiler and the code rules know that I don't intend this to be searchable. So no big deal, you can ignore me. Uh, and I will possibly do that to some of these others. And then let's see. Uh, let's see. Uh, we also have a few odds and ends here. Uh, group processing only contains uh, promoted actions that are not set to promote it only equals true. Okay. Uh, I'm guessing this one's a UI decluttering suggestion in that uh, we have one action, it's set to promoted, uh, but it also is going to be in the group, so it's warning us that this is a little bit messy um, and that we should either not have it promoted true uh, or set it to promoted only equals true. Uh, if we had more actions in this group, it would not give us that warning. So that makes sense. And then here on this copy to button, I haven't given it an image. Um, you will notice that when you turn on the code analyzers that you will see some sluggishness um, sometimes here and there when you first open up a file because it is rechecking the file. Um, I have noticed too that with the code uh, analyzers turned on, uh, as you are writing the code, every once in a while the code analyzer just loses its mind. It does not know how to process the new information you've written. Um, and if that happens, it's best to just close and reopen the file uh, every once in a while, but it has not been the case lately for me. Uh, every once in a while, I will need to reopen the whole darn Visual Studio code. Uh, not as much of a problem as it used to be. Okay, so we only have a small number of problems from UI Cop. That's cool. Um, I obviously don't plan to put this on App Source, but I am curious what sort of rules are going to blow up. Yeah, 
that's not too bad. All right, so we have some perfectly reasonable complaints in app.json. Um, all right, and then it's pretty similar sort of issues in that we are missing some application areas, so they won't show up thing uh, in places in the search, but we also will get warnings about the uh, data classification for the fields, uh, because if we are going to put something in app source, it needs to comply with a GDPR. And to comply with GDPR, uh, or even have hope of being compliant with GDPR, we have to have the data classification fields. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, but thankfully, we're not trying to make this app source compatible, as silly and fun as that might be to put into app source. Okay. Um, so yeah, that's pretty minor. All right, so uh, between now and next session, I will come on back and enable the big, the big monster and fix up all of these various problems. Uh, and it's gonna take some, some time tidy work. I might put that off till this weekend uh, and do some of that over the weekend. And for now, I will shut off our code analyzers. So you can uh, specify all these code analyzers and then just toggle it to false when you're working on things for a little while uh, and you just want uh, Visual Studio Code to be faster. If you're working on a slower machine or something like that, uh, there can be value to just shutting off the code analyzers, coding, and then fixing the issues once you're done. Uh, reviewing things. One of the things that I have not found any way to do that I wish I could, uh, you can copy this information but not out to anything that seems useful. Me, I very much would love to know if anyone knows a way to export this problem list to like a text file so we can pop it into Excel, use it as a worksheet, that would be delightful, uh, but so far I don't know of a way to do that. <coughs> Okay, all right, so that was not too bad. Uh, we were able to get pretty far through translations and CodeCop. Um, I'm obviously not going to spend a whole lot of time doing CodeCop fixes on screen, but neat, there we are. Um, excellent. Well, in that case, we might as well finish up the last little bits of the import routine we were working on yesterday, uh, which is pretty cool to me because uh, there was something I wanted to get to yesterday that we did not get to uh, because I am absolutely in love with the idea of being able to do some of that text parsing that we talked about wanting to be able to do. So uh, we have a crazy data field like this and I very much want to be able to parse a single cell like this in a quick sort of way and I am going to bring in our example. Thanks, Excel. Uh, I'm going to bring in our example uh, so that way we can see what that looks like. Uh, so now, uh, because we are going to do some looping through that and need some variables specific to this, I'm inclined to create a little function, which will be parse bomb cell and we will pass it uh, which master item we're working on, which I believe is code 20, and we will pass it the bill of material text, which is just going to be a text, and we don't need at this point to return anything, so uh, Let's go ahead and shrink down our problems because I think that's getting a little in our way here. Um, I do record this at a larger resolution to make it a little more view friendly. Uh, when I'm working on my local machine, I usually have a lot more real estate than I've scrunched this down to, which is I think 720p. Um, and, but that's in order to make it uh, a little more readable for everyone, uh, regardless of the platform they're watching this on. Uh, a couple of people have asked me offline of, is it only available in 720? Yes, because uh, 1080 scrunch is a little too tough on some screens. So. Okay, so uh, what we are going to do then is simply uh, parse our bill of material cell with which master item, and we are going to pass the 
get cell value at row number uh, row number and column 11. Now, as, as mentioned, uh, unfortunately, I am just hard coding some column numbers. I usually feel that's acceptable practice in most Excel import situations, because typically you uh, go ahead, you tell people that this is the template file and you need to comply with this template. Uh, you absolutely can do this in different ways, um, but the code is much more complex. So. Right, uh, since we are going to uh, create some uh, bill of material items, we are going to need to have variables down at this level. I'm a big fan of letting uh, Control S real quick reformat your indents. Uh, <laughs> call it laziness, call it efficiency, whatever. Uh, in this case, same difference. Um, all right, so now we have our example, which I'm going to steal from up here. Let's see. Uh, perfectly legitimate and Good question uh, for uh, from the Twitch chat. Um, as this current routine is run, uh, we are going to do this wrong. <laughs> um, in this case, we are saying we want to filter on row number greater than one, and then we iterate through. The problem is, is that we iterate through here, then here then here, then here, and here, and here. So we skip right over. We won't get any errors with that coding uh, because we are doing the get cell value calls, but that does mean that we are very, very inefficiently processing this row seven times, <laughs> seven or eight times, too many. Uh, so absolutely correct. We can do something a little bit interesting. Um, we can set our filter. No, not formula. Thank you very much for your autocomplete help in this case. Uh, we can set our filter on this to column one, but uh, by setting a filter here, when we do the get cell value, that does mean that we will lose uh, the uh, ability to correctly go to the other columns here. Uh, because uh, when we do the dot get, uh, there will be nothing in column two. This will return nothing. Uh, so if I were to have said, oh, you know, I'll be smart. I'll filter this to only column one. Well, then the rest of it will do nothing. Uh, so you have to be a little bit careful when you add filters and then use the same variable. So what we are going to then do is we are going to clear our column one filter. Oi, autocomplete today is not being my friend. Uh, we are going to clear the filter on column and in our case, because we know uh, that we are filtering on column one when we do this get cell value, uh, we can be a little bit lazy, and just a little bit, <laughs> a little lazy, and say uh, set filter back on the column to one. That's fine. Um, if we were not sure, uh, so absolutely certain about the fact that we were going to filter on column one like we are here, what I would do is I would create a new uh, variable to park our filter set. Much like we park our position, you can park your filter set uh, from here, and then we could reapply it down here below. And that would work just fine. So, um, so yep. Now we can be a lot more efficient uh, by only iterating through these four cells. So, uh, and then our get cell calls will still do what they need to do over here. So, yep, chat, you are absolutely correct. Um, so, um, we do 
have to be conscientious when we start getting into this many lines of code when we add filters that we are smart about removing them. Uh, so that's the only thing is just just watch your uh, when you add them you go through and go is there anywhere else where we would potentially then be in trouble if we don't remove them and then when we remove them be careful about it. do we need to put them back. All right, so now we know that we are going to get from this crazy field, we are getting item, comma, quantity, semicolon, repeat. Uh, so this might be 2003, 10. So, I mean, that's just nutty, uh, but I've seen crazier data from users, so we'll try it. And the way we're going to try this is we are going to use something that I have not used much before, but it is so fun that we're getting it. Uh, we are going to get uh, a list of text. Uh, what am I thinking of here? I thought it was list of text. Mm. Okie dokie, I am losing my little mind. Good stuff. Let's come on back to our list data type. And here, ah, okay, list of text, yeah. There is definitely a reason I keep the Microsoft Docs site open in a tab somewhere on my system pretty much all the time. <laughs> You never want to get in a position where you uh, could have easily solved your problem if you just looked in the manual. Uh, okay, so that component list is going to be where we're going to break up these complex little records between our semicolons. Um, so we will get an array of three text strings, which is cool but then we're also going to get uh, a set of components within it. So it is double layered, double layered data. And we can do that again. So now we can use something that I've not gotten to use much in BC, and boy, am I looking forward to it here. Hopefully I won't lose too much craziness here. Uh, we can use our for each, which is crazy. Uh, component entry uh, in component. Let me check something here. So for each, I don't suppose snippet wise you want to help me out here. For each. Ah, there we are. When in doubt, T and then what you're looking for. Odds are good you can get the. Uh, formatting of how that's actually supposed to be handled for you. Um, <laughs> it takes some getting used to to remember you can do that. Uh, so uh, we are going to get a component entry in component list. Cool. Uh, okay, and we do need to define that. I was hoping we could be lazy, but I'm not really surprised. Uh, BC and AL code is pretty enforced on the, you can't declare new variables within the context of the code. So I was going to be surprised if that worked. <laughs> All right, component entry is going to be one of our text entries. And then we will have component uh, I guess part, yeah, sure. Okay, so for each component entry, which will be this chunk, we will cycle through. And now there's nothing in this code here that says what is actually the list here, um, because component list hasn't been defined yet. This code is perfectly valid because we told it component list is a list. Huh, okay, yeah, that's cool. Um, so what you can do, which is pretty cool, is we don't even really need that variable because we have on our text data type 
something that we've not had in previous versions, this delightful little split function. And you can see here in our procedure, it takes a list of separators as a parameter, and then it returns a list of text. So in fact, I have my variables a little wrong. We need the semi-separator, and we'll probably need our component, uh, comma separator. Cool. And I want to have my semi-separator dot add semicolon, and I want to have comma separator dot add comma, and then we'll pass in our semi-separator. And now we are going for each component entry through the bill of material split results. Um, so that's cool. We could also do a quick check before we dive into this loop if there is a semicolon in the provided text, uh, because oftentimes it's going to be a blank entry. Uh, as we can see here, when we hit this cell, there's no reason for us to even bother doing that split function call uh, because the cell's empty. So uh, whenever possible, if you know that you're frequently going to encounter data that doesn't matter, uh, bomb text. I th find that really interesting that we can do some of these string functions. There were there were so many string functions we didn't used to have. Uh, I, I mean, I'm just losing my mind with some of these pad left, pad rights. I say, whoa. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm going to get to know a lot more of those functions because that's exciting, sadly. <laughs> uh, all right. So if bomb text equals blank, then we can bail out of this function entirely. Let's be efficient on things. Um, but if we do have something, it should comply with this. I'm not going to do the semicolon check, but now we can say uh, we do want our component entry to be a list of text because we are going to split um, component entry. I stand corrected. I want my component part to be list text. There we are. Sometimes the hardest part is coming up with names for variables. So component part is going to equal our component entry dot split with our comma separator. Cool. So now we should have these two elements as two text elements in the list of component part. And now we will need to check that that uh, second part is a correct number. So possible quantity is a decimal. And we should uh, pull out the uh, component and we'll keep it as text for simplicity here, but uh, eventually the code cop will complain at me that uh, I'm going to do some get calls against the item table here. Uh, so let's see. So a possible item is going to equal component part dot ah, okay. Interesting. I'm still getting used to some of the new functions in AL code. Uh, in order to give you the ability to if wrapper them, like if the get is successful, uh, you don't get a result set. You pass in a parameter variable for it to assign the result text. Um, and this is partly due to AL code's limitations on the fact that we can only really return a value um, in AL code. So it makes sense. Uh, so what this is going to do then is we can say if uh, component yep, if component part dot get uh, and I believe list is one indexed. Guess we'll be finding out. Yep, there it is. Yep, one base index. That's pretty standard for AL code to start with one, not zero. Uh, so if we get something in position one and possible item, okay, if we get that, 
then if possible item uh, does not equal blank then then we have something to do here so now we'll also grab uh, and we're gonna be going pretty deep on this if chaining so that's fun uh, if component part dot get to uh, so we need a possible quantity as text because we have to pass it in as a variable mm -hmm. yep. all right possible quantity text possible quantity text then if evaluate uh, well, actually, if possible quantity text does not equal blank, then if evaluate uh, into possible quantity, we could be doing a monstrous and chain when we've got a wall of ifs like this. Uh, you could be doing if this and this and that and that and that. Um, I'm going with nesting this for the moment because that mm, stylistically works for me and uh, if i need to splice something in between things later uh, it's a lot easier to splice in and else when you if chain um, so part of this is just my experience of needing to handle exceptions later in a more thoughtful way uh, making me want to have giant scary if chains rather than giant scary and statements okay so we've gotten down to this layer so we have uh, checks we have a possible item and a possible quantity decimal so now we can say we're going to do much like we did up here. We can cheat in and copy some of the code, which as mentioned, if you're copying code, odds are good it should be a function. Mm. So uh, we're going to pass in the possible item and we're gonna pass in the possible quantity. Something I am not doing uh, here, uh, which is potentially dangerous um, but you know we'll get a nice error on things because of table relations I am handing an item number untested into this item number um, it would be smarter to ch do a quick check against the item table to see if that item actually exists first but since I'm not doing that when I try to do the assignment this having a table relation uh, it'll throw an error message uh, at the user anyways um, so I could have been gentler and said I'll wrap this up and say okay uh, I will could throw an error message at the user and then that would again give me the ability to say which cell and uh, row number is the problem coming from uh, I am not going to I'm, I'm gonna be lazy and evil I believe that this will let you put bad data in here, but I think on the insert it'll potentially validate that. Let's uh, let's play it safe. Um, reasonable. As always, uh, getting some very useful feedback in chat about uh, things that we're doing, so <laughs> appreciate it. Um, so let's play it safe and we'll validate the uh, possible item. Because when we do assignments as developers, we are allowed and given the power to do dangerous things that possibly uh, <laughs> possibly are going to ruin the world. Um, I have in a production database written code that did gl entry dot delete all customer ledger entry dot delete all and things like that before rebuilding those records um, talk about a nightmare <laughs> uh, I, I ran that code on a production database uh, with years of data in it um, for good reason but oof. <laughs> uh, some horror stories but it was a bet <laughs> so all right uh, 
Okay, so that's looking pretty good. Uh, we don't need to return anything. If it worked, it worked. If it didn't work, it didn't work. No big deal. Uh, yeah, all right. You know, I'm feeling brave. I say we publish this and try it and see what happens. I have no idea. It's exciting. <laughs> so let's go to our good old friend, import master items. Let's see what happens. See what terrible things I forgot. Okay, well, I forgot to refresh, apparently. Picky, picky. Wasn't sure if we would need to, but maybe. So, import master items, choose, use. I might have worked without an error, and I just didn't know it. Guess we'll find out. Oh, well. That's interesting. Uh, 2001, 2002, and then we get a second round of that. That's interesting. All right, so we got to this entry here and we parsed this data and it looked pretty good, but we have a doubling effect going on. Ah, I know exactly what the issue is. I ran it one time got the error about you need to refresh etc and then i ran it a second time and i have not added any logic into this handling of this funky cell uh, to remove any existing entries that don't comply with these which means that it ran successfully the first time creating one and one and then we ran it again creating one and one. So if we do something crazy like 55 and 77 and kill our formatting in the process, <laughs> that would have been a fun blow up. Uh, if we import this again, we should see that that's the issue. Uh, and it would help if I ran the right master items. And we're just about wrapping up for the day here because we are a few minutes over, but I want to see that this is working. And there we are. Yeah. So, okay. So, uh, the simple, lazy way for me to handle this, given that I'm probably the main system administrator of running this little one, uh, and I'm probably the only lunatic who is going to type up a bill of material like this uh, for now, uh, the simple way to handle this would be that before we parse this cell, we should. I'm going to do this because we're not to doing it right now. Uh, any item bill of material on the master uh, that isn't class one, remove it. So what we can do is all of these items are the class one items based on our columns and anything beyond here uh, should be cleared off of the entire bill of material and then repopulated. It's a messy way to do it, but I think that's our best bet way to do that. Uh, when we create our next level of uh, connecting things up to the master item, master bill of material, master routing tables, this will produce a little extra system chatter because we are going to regenerate the bill of materials in the player companies for all those given items. Um, but I think that's pretty pretty much the only good way to handle that uh, because uh, we don't necessarily <sighs> we may revisit this as a further follow-up to do to do a comparative uh, before and after to consider a delta change uh, that could get a little funky But I think for our initial <laughs> wave one, just to keep this moving along, I think we'll probably do a simple, if it's not class one, remove it. Okay. Uh, I did not create the routing table for master items yet, so we cannot process the import of the steps, but it's going to work even simpler than this crazy little uh, for each 
uh, combination and uh, cross-checking loop here. So I think we will probably dele relegate that to an off-camera little piece of uh, code, um, much like the code cop busy work. <laughs> um, great. Uh, so our next stop up in the series tomorrow uh, is going to be uh, we're going to create a code unit that watches these tables for changes and populates that out to the player companies so that way I can maintain an item list going forward and that will update everyone else that is running the system uh, and once we're done with that because hopefully that won't take too long uh, maybe maybe half a session uh, we will also update our core code uh, that generates new companies and copy all of the class one items uh, to item records. And that'll be the beginning of our function sets for item generation because we need to uh, create descriptions and uh, base units of measure and item unit of measure and a variety of other subsidiary tables. Um, and then Hopefully that puts us in a good shape next week for uh, focusing on some of the transaction generation. Because I don't know about you guys, but I really would like to see the basic class one buying and selling bots start ticking over uh, by the end of next week. So that way we can actually see some stuff happening. Um, we will probably uh, not put in place any of the handling of the logistics bots just yet. Uh, so that way, uh, anything that's bought and sold just automatically is received initially. Um, and that way we can test drive just seeing the flow of things. I think that'll be a lot of fun. So, okay. Uh, all right. Well, I think that will do nicely for today. I think there's lots of power to just being able to use the translate functionality. Um, and I'm looking forward to playing with this in some of my production projects. Uh, I have several languages that I potentially need to translate some things between, and this will make a great deal of help. So I appreciate all of you sticking with and sticking around for a little extra, and looking forward to seeing everyone tomorrow. Thanks for watching.